Okay, so we are back with part two and a quick recap. So here's some vitals and basic information of the case, just to refresh your mind here. And really, you know, this is our first visit with our patient. Uh, we see here that we've got some vitals that may not be fantastic. And um, we've also got some symptom presentation here to consider. And we... in looking at our, yeah, go ahead, Molly. Oh, I was gonna say, before we get too quick, um... I think there's a couple of things to just point out to get everybody thinking before we get to the question is what does it mean if you are making an initial home visit alone? So that's something maybe to consider for just a minute. And then we get this piece of clinical information that they are diaphoretic and short of breath with these vital signs and this blood glucose. So that's the thing I just wanted to let everybody digest for a second um, before we get to these questions. So. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a great point. And it's good to pause here. Um, safety planning, right, is always at the forefront yeah. of what we do with every with every patient and every scene. And it's no different for community paramedicine. One of the domains, of course, is CP wellness and safety. And so um, certainly, yes, totally agree that as you're looking at any patient case presentation, your own safety, your partner's safety, scene safety should be, should be forefront there. And mm -hmm. we'll definitely talk about that with one of the discussion questions too. Mm -hmm. The next piece here is our physical exam. Molly, do you have any thoughts about physical exam here? Uh, well, to me as a clinician, it always starts with vital signs, right? You know, and what's that quick, rapid assessment? So diaphoretic and sweating with vitals of temp 99.5, heart rate 99, BP 178 over 100, respirations are 24, O2 sats are 89 on room air and a blood glucose of 236. So in, in the beginning of this clinical picture, when she says, you know, I've got this new onset diabetes, a blood glucose of 236 is not the worst blood glucose I've ever seen. Um, it, it does not, to me, beg that she's in DKA or anything yet, although it's not good and it's not at goal. I, I don't put a lot of stock in that. She's not hypoglycemic either. So that's one of the big things that jumps out to me. Um, and we don't really know, you know, the SATs are a little bit low, her temps up, her BPs up a little bit. So those are just some things I'm going to tuck away, but just immediately it doesn't say to me that she's exactly completely unstable. She needs some help for sure, but does she need to be just immediately whisked away to the hospital? I think we got to keep digging a little bit for that. And so the rest of her assessment is that she um, is, you know, pupils are equally reactive to light. She's wearing glasses. Her ears are clear. Um, she has a patent nose. She's wearing dentures. She is a little tachypnic and wheezing a little bit bilaterally. On any time we give some type of medical test, wheezing is always something that is generally considered synonymous with asthma or COPD. So that's an important piece there. Um, she's tacky, her rhythm's irregular. Um, so back to the differential we were talking about, AFib, that tends to bring that to mind for me. She's got a little edema that brings the differential of heart failure to my mind. Her belly seems normal. She's a little unsteady, which makes me think, could she fall? And is she stable to get around the house? And then um, the psych, the PH2Q questionnaire, that is one of our screenings for depression, which when we have elderly patients with chronic illness, we should always be screening for depression, other signs of mental illness. And she's positive on that, meaning that she has said yes to the two questions. Have you lost interest in things you previously enjoyed or do you feel depressed? And she has said yes. So there's additional mental health assessment that needs to go on for her there on that physical exam. Um, there's a couple of other things just as you're studying for this test, while our EMS brains go immediately to this physical exam, don't forget to have that knowledge base about some of these other things that's mentioned in her HPI, like those social determinants. She lives alone, neighbor for transportation, and even things like what's the difference between Medicare, Medicaid? Do you know the difference in Medicare Part A, B, D? 
what is a supplemental insurance plan, all of that speaks into the knowledge base that you're going to have to have in community paramedicine to respond um, to a patient like this. So, Yeah, there's so much gold here. And, and Molly, I love the fact that at first you started to talk about the vitals, right, which our brains always go to first and foremost. And, uh, you know, you kind of mentioned what are the clues that I have here that she may be stable or unstable. And mm -hmm. that's the big question for a lot of teams and also on the exam is mm -hmm. you will have patient cases on the exam. You will have to be starting to make those decisions about do I transport this patient? Do I not transport this patient? And certainly um, you can start to see a little bit of the thought process here of, you know, certain vitals that may be out of range or elevated or, or not completely at goal, but, uh, you know, they're not critical at this stage. And so that gives you a little bit of leeway in order to, you know, potentially bring in a doctor via telehealth that brings you some opportunity to, um, you know, get on the phone with the primary care and try to help solve some of these acute issues that may be putting her at risk of getting hospitalized or calling uh, 911 again in the next few days. So I love that introductory discussion there about, um, you know, what would have to be true for the patient to be stable enough for me to treat here at home versus what would have to be true for the patient to be unstable and not eligible for treat at home or not eligible for telehealth and we have to transport them. Um, so that's certainly a skill to, to work on and focus on as you're preparing to test. The other piece here, and, you know, we talked into this physical exam components and a little bit on the assessments like the PHQ-2, and uh, a big part of community paramedicine is then starting to figure out what additional assessments need to be done for this patient that are not typical in EMS, right, but are very relevant for chronic disease management, for preventative care, uh, even things like she wears glasses. So she probably needs a visual acuity exam. Has she gone mm -hmm. for her annual eye exam? Mm -hmm. How often should she be having that done? Um, so those are different components relative to disease management and preventative care and community health that mm -hmm. certainly come into play for you to start thinking about as you're going through physical exam. So uh, we could talk forever on this, Molly. Yes. I know this is yes. our what we live and breathe every day, but let's go into our discussion questions and just make sure that we get through some of these. So mm -hmm. Molly, I'll let you kind of um, recap. Sure. So, you know, mm -hmm. for that initial visit, anything else that we want to chime in on there that we haven't talked about already? Well, just to be thinking through, um, you know, especially from the exam taking standpoint, uh, when you are developing your MIH program and when you are planning, no agency is going to do things exactly alike, right? So you have to remember that this is a national exam. When you're taking the test, you have to think about what would it be reasonable for any community paramedic to do when they are making the first visit versus a follow-up visit versus a discharge visit? What are those safety features that need to be true? Are you going to do status checks, this or that? So when you're answering a safety question or that initial visit question, you have to think about answering it from the standpoint of, is this something reasonable that any community paramedic would be doing, maybe not just what goes on in your program. So the first one is when you're performing that initial visit alone, that's what the question is telling you. What actions need to be taken before the visit, during the visit, and after? So before, you know, basic things, does somebody know where you are? What's going to be your communication with dispatch? How does all of that work? When you're there in the home, are you doing that safety assessment of the room? Where's the position of the doors, the windows, the dog? Um, any uh, Are there firearms in the home? And then even when you leave, uh, is there anything that needs to be done at the end to just ensure that piece of safety? So that's some of the things to be thinking about with that question one and back to that test domain of community paramedic wellness and safety. And then the yeah, determinants. And even 
Yeah, absolutely. Even even the time of day, if you're a 24 hour service, that might be different uh, than if you are a 12 hour service. But on an exam question, they're not looking at your specific program, right? So they're mm. looking at big picture. Um, you might have a program that's focused on um, addiction or you know maybe in a high crime area, and so your specific protocols may be more robust or more intense than uh, than any other program in the U.S. So just just keep that in mind, right? That you're not answering questions about your specific program, but in general, what would be expected for anybody in this industry to do? The social determinants of health piece, you know, um, we want to, as always, be thinking about, you know, what are the neighborhood factors? Are they in a pharmacy desert? Are they in a food desert area? Um, you know, is public transportation available for this patient? What is the, you know, condition of the home that I'm looking at? Do I need to um, perform a home safety assessment uh, to go along with that and then correlate it to what does she have access to from a social determinant standpoint? What are the community resources that are available? So if the home, for example, were in disarray um, or she doesn't have transportation there at her home, you know, what are the social determinants components that I can incorporate into the care plan to, you know, get a wheelchair ramp built out for her or to um, connect her to um, durable medical equipment because of the challenges for her to get access to that because of where she lives. So, um, you know, that goes into some of the things that we've already talked about for sure. Um, does she need access to, um, you know, uh, medication delivery, for example, is there a way that we can organize PT or OT to come out to her house versus her, you know, um, going to visit somebody. So the social determinants of health factor, uh, can be significant here. Mm -hmm. Agree. And some of the differentials with her, uh, sweating and shortness of breath, we talked about that a little bit already, but the question uh, three here is really getting at knowing your key findings of your physical exam. What key findings would need to be reported back to the provider? So if you're the CP there in the home and let's say you have access to a provider via telehealth, what exactly are you going to be reporting back? What are some of the key things? So certainly, you know, basic things like vital signs. As a provider myself, I would want to know that this patient is symptomatic. She's tachypnic. She's wheezing. Um, she's got some edema, that type of thing. So there, um, there's definitely some key things in this physical exam. I think it's challenging um, I, for community paramedics. There's a whole chapter um, in the AOS book on physical exam, physical assessment, because some of those assessments are not the same as what we would do in um, as what we would do in emergency situations. For example, you might notice that there's an exam of her ear canals, her uh, Perla, her actual vision, maybe with a Snellen chart or a Rosenbaum card. So there's some different pieces that go into that. And you have to know as a community paramedic, how to interpret those pieces and really how to perform those pieces so that you can report that back to your provider. Yeah, for sure. This question is certainly relevant to the domain on the CPC exam. Uh, relevant to multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary care. And so always be thinking about not just to your, your medical director, but her primary care, her endocrinologist, um, you know, what needs to be reported to the social worker. So also starting to think about what does that interdisciplinary care plan look like? And mm -hmm. so that's a good segue. So the next question is exactly that, you know, what is the plan of care that should be implemented? And also, when is our next uh, MIHCP follow-up? We're, we're not going to be leaving this lady for a month here, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's clear um, that this patient needs close follow-up. You know, how close, you know, sometimes, especially with diabetics, I see them every week, every day, every other day until we get some stability going. Um, so that might be something reasonable uh, to expect for this patient here. I also find with new onset diabetics that you can't tell them too much too fast because you have just blown their mind with the idea that they're diabetic. So all they heard you say is 
So I can't eat what I want. I can't do what I want. You know, it takes a minute to digest a diagnosis like that. And now all of a sudden I have to give myself shots every day and I have to poke my finger every day. And so I do find that this is a diagnosis that takes a lot of initial follow up. And then once things become more stable, we can back off on that a little bit. So, you know, um, my initial feeling is regardless if she gets transported or not, there's going to need to be a plan for perhaps daily contact with her until she is a little bit more stable on some of this plan of care. Yeah. And it depends too, you know, when you're doing the patient education there in the home, uh, you know, you have to prioritize just like what Molly is saying. Um, you want to prioritize um, what is the one thing that when I leave today, I want her to be able to do or accomplish, or what's the goal for the next three days, right? For her to be able to do. So, you know, maybe that is as simple as how to inject her insulin mm -hmm. or how to check her blood sugar, right? So it can be a, one little component at a time. And certainly you always want to be thinking about all the different pieces that will go into that care plan that you want to achieve, um, but, but fully agree, right? What is the care plan that should be developed? And then how do you kind of roll that out over a series of visits? And I would echo as well that depending on how well in a teach back education session, she's able to demonstrate that she's following you, that she's able to then, you know, um, execute on what instructions she's given, that would be a significant factor, right? In do I come back and visit her tomorrow? Do I come back in three days? Do I come back next week? Um, but certainly probably not longer than a week for this patient, given her acute issues. Mm -hmm. So the interprofessional collaboration, you know, we've already kind of referred to that. Uh, she's got, she had some clues, right, from um, just a diagnostic standpoint that referral to endocrinology, you know, referral to pulmonology for COPD management and possible inhaler management. Those obviously would be great options, but she had some things even on physical exam, right? Like she had unsteady gait, for example. And if you identify that she's got unsteady gait and do like a tug test or one of the other falls risk assessments, you may also find based on how she performs there that she could get a referral to physical therapy or occupational therapy or a referral for some um, medical equipment, a walker or some other assistant device. Any mm -hmm. other thoughts there before we talk about transport? My only comment is, again, we talk about shifting from your emergency brain to your community paramedicine brain. And while yes, we have collaboration with specialists, I think in the acute medicine side of the house, you were very accustomed to reaching out to, I need a cardiologist, I need a nephrologist, I need an endocrinologist. Most of this patient's issues can be very easily managed in primary care. So don't forget to reach out for your primary care partners, um, whether that's in private practice, a federally qualified health center, a community health center, because a lot of issues can get resolved there first without having to overwhelm her with appointment after appointment after appointment. And so I can't emphasize that enough is to make sure that that transition of care happens probably first and then have a systematic way that we're making a decision about what specialists we're bringing in and at what time. I agree that she needs to probably see all of those but back to those social determinants, what about transportation? What about logistics? What about, you know, if nothing else, I would rather them be established with primary care. So, yeah, it's a great point. And also for each of you in your communities, when we talk about social determinants, when we talk about access to care, you know, it's very possible that the pulmonology appointment, the first available is six months, six to eight That's months. Right. So, she's not going to have success if we wait on that, right, to manage her COPD. The yeah. other piece of this is that, you know, we're not really focused here on, um, for this question on, you know, the management of a program and building out stakeholder reporting and all of that, but your stakeholders in your community and those that you have the best relationships with 
often it is going to be the FQHC. It is going to be the local primary care offices. And they're going to be the ones that know you and know what you're about and, and are going to be willing to talk to you and take a suggestion or get some feedback as well. So that's a fantastic point. You know, the transportation piece here, probably not too much to say uh, on that. We've already kind of discussed what pieces would be looking for, um, for identifying if the patient's stable or not stable. Anything else that we want to talk about before we do part three? I don't think so. Awesome. We'll see you guys in a minute. 